Hi, it's Mark from Ripple Training. So a lot of shooters these days are using cameras like the Sony a7S III that are capable of outputting a ProRes RAW signal to an external monitor recorder like the Ninja 5. You can then work with these ProRes files directly in Final Cut Pro. Now I've been getting a lot of questions about ProRes RAW. So in this MacBreak Studio, I'm going to show you how to set up your camera and your Ninja 5 for shooting ProRes RAW. And then I'm going to show you how to work with these ProRes RAW files in Final Cut Pro. Before we dive into the details, a couple of disclaimers. First, Atomos sponsored this video. They're interested in more people understanding the benefits and process of working with ProRes RAW since their monitor recorders enable it. However, they had no input for the content and they did not review it before we published it. Also, I purchased my Ninja 5 last fall when the A7S III came out, well before this video was conceived. For me, this device is a no-brainer, even if you don't use it to record ProRes RAW or even ProRes for that matter. The monitor features alone make it an indispensable part of my production gear. Having a larger, brighter screen for evaluating composition, focus, and exposure, using customizable zebras, false color, and focus peaking, installing custom LUTs that match the LUTs I plan to use in Final Cut, and the ability to use battery power in the field or AC power in my studio are all features I use regularly. Add on top of that the fact that it can record edit-friendly ProRes files in multiple flavors to inexpensive SSDs simultaneously with my camera recording XAVC internally for redundancy. So I'll use my Ninja 5 even in situations where I'm not even shooting ProRes RAW. Which brings me to my second disclaimer. Although I'll be discussing the benefits of ProRes RAW and some of the drawbacks, I'm not trying to convince you to use ProRes RAW. I'm assuming you've come to that conclusion yourself and you just want to know the workflow for doing so. If you're still on the fence, I'd recommend a couple of excellent videos. First is a two-part video by the DP Journey on the pros and cons of working with ProRes RAW. Links are in the description below. I'll also provide a link to Gerald and Dunn's fantastically detailed video on setting up the Ninja 5 in general so we can focus on ProRes RAW. If you don't already know these guys, I highly recommend that you go immediately, check them out on YouTube, and subscribe. Go ahead, I'll wait here. Oh, all done? Fantastic. Let's get into it. Okay, to shoot ProRes RAW, first you're going to need a camera that supports exporting ProRes RAW like the A7S III. On Atomos's website, you can find an extensive list of cameras that are compatible with the monitor recorder of your choice. Just make sure the camera includes the ProRes RAW graphic. Second, is the Ninja itself, or there are a few other monitor recorders from Atomos that will do that. Uh, the Ninja is kind of the least expensive and most portable version. And uh, like I said, I love this thing. So you'll need that. You'll need a cable to connect the two. Uh, supposedly any HDMI cable will do, but um, I've found a few of my cables don't work that great. I've had some issues with the connection. So I actually bought the Atomos cable and this has worked flawlessly. So I recommended that uh, just to make sure you've got a good cable. I like the coiled cable since it doesn't really get in the way very much and it still works well on a gimbal. Uh, in fact, I've had to kind of stretch this out so that it doesn't bind on the gimbal too much, but it seems to be a good solution. Uh, the next thing is media. And I'm using these little uh, plastic cases that hold standard SSDs. And Atomos makes these really cool Atom X drives that perfectly fit on the back of this. These stick out a little, as you can see here. Uh, it just sticks out a little bit, but I don't care. It's uh, inexpensive and a great solution Then you just buy internal SSDs and put them in with four screws that come with these little plastic cases. And then for the battery, you can either use, uh, it comes with a power supply. So like in my studio, I have it connected to a power supply. So it's powered all the time when I'm doing uh, zooming or you know streaming in the studio. Um, but this is an NP750 uh, battery, I believe. And you can get smaller ones, but uh, this is nice. It gives me several hours of recording time and just clicks right in there very easily. So. That's pretty much what you need. You can see I also have this small rig kind of rig uh, on here, but it's not necessary. In fact, all the shooting I just did, this didn't arrive in time for my trip. So I just shot with this um, mounted directly to the camera's hot shoe. 
and it worked great. But I love this rig, so it's even better now. And that's what you need. So now let's look at how to set up the camera and your Ninja. First thing, you want them both connected. You want the Ninja turned on and the camera turned on. And let's start with our camera settings. Now, if you have a different camera from the a7S III, obviously these settings will be a little bit different, but they should be close to the same. I'll press the menu button, and then I'll scroll down to the last icon, which is the toolbox. Within the toolbox, I'll go down to the second to last set, which is external output number 11. And then we'll walk through these. So the first one is HDMI resolution. You could set this to 1080p if you had space considerations, but really, you probably want to set that to 4K or 2160p. Then we go to HDMI output settings. There's several in here. First one is record media during HDMI output. I put that to on so that I have a backup. In addition to all my media being recorded in ProRes RAW to the Ninja 5, I also have media being recorded to my internal SD card in the codec that I've selected. Next, output resolution. You want to match to what we just saw for HDMI output resolution. In my case, I'm choosing 4K. You could also do 1080. And then here's the key one, really, is raw output. Off by default, you want to turn that on. Once you do, you'll get a warning that you need a device that supports raw output, which the Ninja 5 does. Fantastic. Next, once you enable raw output, two new parameters become available. The raw output setting, which allows you to choose a frame rate. In NTSC world, that's 24, 30, or 60p. In PAL, you're going to have 25 or 50. I don't think there's a 30 option, but 25 or 50. So 60 as high as you can go. If you need to shoot some slow motion, I would choose 60p. Otherwise, I'd choose 24p to save on disk space. The color gamut for raw output depends on your camera and what color science it has available. On the A7S III, you can choose S Gamut 3 or S Gamut 3 Cine. I prefer the look of the Cine, and both of them have the same S Log 3 Gamma. So I'll select that. I'll leave time code output set to on. And then I like Rec Control to be on. What this enables me to do is to trigger both the Ninja and the camera recording just by pressing the record button on the camera. We'll back out of that. We don't need to mess with control for HDMI. I'll back out of that. And we're pretty much set up. One important thing to note is once you've set your frame rate for ProRes RAW output, that frame rate dictates the frame rate that the camera's going to do internally. So if I go up to my uh, very first menu item for shooting, go to image quality, you can see my file format right now is XAVC HS 4K. What you choose is really up to you there. Um, but my movie settings, notice I cannot change my frame rate because it's being determined by raw movies. So that's what's happening there. You just need to be aware that your frame rate will be dictated by the frame rate chosen for raw output. Okay, now for setting up the Ninja. When it's turned on, we want to go into the menus. Now, you want to make sure that this button is not pressed here, which will give you the display menus if you press the menu button. But I'm going to turn that off so when we press the menu button, we get the general menus. First thing you want to do is scroll all the way to the right to info and make sure you're using the most recent firmware update, which at the time of this recording is 10.62. And check if you have that or check if there's a newer one available because it will give you more functionality, which we'll talk about a little bit later. From there, you go to activation. And if you haven't already done so, you need to activate the capability to record in ProRes RAW. Use a QR code or go to the URL there. It's free, but you do have to go through the activation process. You can see I've already enabled it here. From there, let's scroll over and I'll go to record. Here's where we choose our codec. And you can see I have ProRes RAW chosen. If I click there, we can go to DNX HD or regular ProRes and different flavors of regular ProRes, but I'll go to ProRes RAW. And then you can choose two different compression formats, ProRes RAW or ProRes RAW HQ. I think ProRes RAW is great and you don't necessarily need the HQ version, which is going to take a little more space. So I'm just using regular ProRes RAW here. You can see the record format is 4.2K. That's based on the sensor size. The 24 frames per second or 2398 is based on our settings in the camera. And then one more important thing at the bottom left corner, it says 16.9 metadata crop. If you turn that off, the, the sensor that's recording it doesn't have quite the same aspect ratio as 16.9. So I find it better and safer to turn on that metadata crop. And I'll explain that a little bit more once we're in Final Cut Pro. 
The only thing you might want to consider doing here is over in your meters, if you have audio being fed directly to the Ninja, you'd enable this analog audio here. I'm taking my audio, uh, as you can see by the meters here, straight from the camera, and it's actually just a backup audio because I'll use a second device to record audio in the field usually and not do it directly off the camera, but uh, just something to be aware of. So once that's all set up, we can go out of that menu. Now I'll go into display and I'll go to the display menu. So a uh, couple things here, let's go to monitor. Here you can choose how you wanna view the image being sent from the camera. If you choose native, you're looking basically at that linear raw output. It looks kind of like log. I don't find that useful. Uh, for recording. You can do Rec. 709, which will give you kind of the broadcast standard by mapping that uh, native raw output into a Rec. 709 color space. That's great and useful if you're not doing anything custom. Um, I would skip HLG and PQ unless you're doing HDR workflows, and we're focused here on more on SDR workflows. What I do is I go to LUT, and then that will apply a LUT based on what I've set up in the LUT tab. You can see here it says neutral A7S3 G3. That is one of the uh, phantom LUTs, which are a set of third-party LUTs that I like and I use in Final Cut Pro. If I go over to LUTs, you can see that I've installed one, two, three, four custom LUTs here. And installing custom LUTs is super easy. You just copy them to your media uh, for the Ninja and uh, connect that, and then you load them up. Very straightforward to do that. Um, you can see this first LUT that I have is actually for a different camera, but it's one of the Leeming LUTs. The second LUT I have is another Leeming LUT also for, for this particular camera. More useful this LUT for me for bright outdoor scenes where I want to kind of push to the right, expose to the right. Uh, the third one is a, a standard Cine mapping from S-Log Cine to Rec. 709. And the fourth is the one that I'm currently using, which is this neutral LUT from, uh, from Phantom. So I set it to that so that I can see exactly what I'll see in Final Cut Pro if I'm using the LUT in both places. And that's the great thing about these lookup tables in terms of monitoring and then seeing what you get in post. And we'll take a look at that. So with that, we're all set up. And in fact, you'll notice if I press the record button now, I'll get a red box around both devices. And you'll see that recording is enabled on the Ninja. I'm recording to both simultaneously just by pressing the record button on the camera. And the Ninja is recording ProRes RAW that you can see at the top there. And my camera is recording an XAVC HS 4K 24P 4200 10-bit, uh, which is what I had chosen in my settings there. And we're ready to go. So what about when you're on set? Is there anything you should do differently in terms of lighting, exposure, and white balance when shooting ProRes RAW as opposed to a camera processed codec? My opinion is no. Even though ProRes RAW will allow you to change your onset ISO, and in some cases also your white balance in post, I would still perform normal white balancing on set, and I'd still make sure to set ISO to a base profile, which for the A7S III is either 640 or 12,800 for S-Log 3 in fact, I'd recommend using a base ISO, even if it means slightly over or underexposing your shot. Now you might say, wait a minute, Mark, raw recording is bypassing the in-camera noise reduction, so does using a base profile even matter? Well, let's take a look at that in Final Cut. So here I have two identical clips that were shot simultaneously through the method I told you about earlier to enable dual recording. The first one is an XAVC clip and the second one is a ProRes RAW clip. They both are set to a camera LUT of the uh, Sony S-Log S3 Gamut 3 Cine. You can see that here, uh, and you can see it here for the camera LUT for the RAW clip. And I changed the ISO in each of them from 12,800 to 10,000. So check this out. Right now I'm just at 61%. I'm gonna go just to 100% because it'll be even obvious there and let's just look at this area of the books. Now remember, when we're looking at this XAVC clip that was shot in camera, it includes the in-camera denoising that's built in, okay? So here we are at 12,800 ISO, and here we are at 10,000. So anything close to a base ISO, you get a lot more noise. All right, let's check out the ProRes RAW version. Here we are at 12,800 at base ISO, and you'll notice there's a lot more noise 
than the XAVC version at 12,800. That's because remember, ProRes RAW, you're getting before any in-camera noise reduction. You need to do that in post. But the point here is, if we go from, from 12,800 over to 10,000, we still get a big jump in noise. So we're totally bypassing the in-camera noise reduction here, but we're still seeing a big difference by using a base ISO profile that inherently has less noise in it. So when shooting ProRes RAW, just like any other time, you want to try to target one of those base ISO, 640 or 12,800 in this case. But kind of the cool thing with ProRes RAW is you can, it, let's say you can't ND your way to get there exactly. You can choose to under or overexpose. It's usually better to overexpose a little bit um, in S-Log3, but you could even underexpose a little bit to hit that 12,800 number you know, if you don't have quite enough light because you can adjust that ISO and post. Adjusting the ISO and post, as we'll see, has no impact on noise. It's only in camera that it helps to hit that base profile. Okay, let's get into some of the benefits of using ProRes RAW in post. First, you're not gonna to need to create proxies or optimized media. In-camera codecs like AGVC, while creating smaller files, are difficult for even newer computers to play back, especially 4K 10-bit 422 files. This clip right here is AGVC, but it's 420, which I shot on purpose so that I can get good playback on these clips when I'm just shooting directly with in-camera files. It's 10-bit, but it's 420, and I've discovered 420 actually looks quite good. If it were a 422 10-bit clip, I'd have trouble playing this back, even on, this is 2019 uh, MacBook Pro. The Pro is raw version, on the other hand, I will not have any problem playing back whatsoever, even though it needs to be both decoded and demosaic in software. It's still less taxing on a computer system. And in fact, is quite comparable to playback performance of ProRes 422HQ. One downside is larger file sizes. So how much bigger? Well, if we go to this HEVC version, Shift F to reveal in browser, right click and choose reveal in finder, we can see that it's 375 megabytes. And if I hit Control D, it's about 30 seconds long. 30 seconds, 375 megabytes. The Pro is version of the same clip, Shift F to reveal in browser, right click to reveal in finder, is 3.84 gigabytes. And here's the HEVC version. So it's about 10 times larger than the HEVC version, which is significant, but it's only slightly bigger than ProRes HQ. And in fact, this clip right below it is a ProRes LT clip of about the same duration. If I double click to open in QuickTime, we can see it. It's actually shot with the output set to record the screen, so it's not very useful, but it's useful for this example. If I get info on it, uh, well, first of all, we can see here it's about 30 seconds long, and it's ProRes LT 2.85 gigs. So my ProRes RAW clip is only about 30% bigger than my ProRes LT clip. It's quite amazing. So, but it's something to keep in mind. For planning purposes, the actual size of ProRes RAW will depend on the scene that you're shooting, how noisy it is. I've found I get anywhere from six gigabytes per minute to 20 gigabytes per minute for these ProRes RAW clips. For planning purposes, I would expect that you can get about an hour and a half of ProRes RAW, not ProRes RAW HQ, but regular ProRes RAW, about an hour and a half into a one hour SSD. Next, you can manipulate your ProRes RAW clips in ways that simply aren't possible with camera processed clips. With the clip in the browser selected, in the Info Inspector, which is currently set to the basic view, we can confirm that the clip is ProRes RAW, but that's about it. If we go to the General or Extended view, we can see that Final Cut has automatically applied a RAW to log conversion and a camera LUT. While you can choose whether to use a camera LUT and which to use for log encoded footage, only with RAW can you choose the RAW to LAW conversion. For example, you could use the conversion of a different camera manufacturer, and that would then apply their color science to the transform, giving you a look more like the shot that came from that camera type. Or you could set it to none so that you're grading with the original linear values. In general, I'd recommend leaving this at the default. Or in this case, since I know I shot with the Cine variation, I'll choose that. For the camera LUT, I'll use the same LUT I used in the Ninja, which in this case was a phantom LUT.
Note that I've previously installed these LUTs here by using this add custom camera LUT command. You could instead set this pop-up to none and then use the creative LUT effect from the effects browser. Or you could set it to none and just grade the log encoded clip directly. And now I have a starting point that should look very much like what I saw on the Ninja screen when shooting. Note that I'm currently working in a regular SDR library. So the LUT that's applied automatically is tone mapping this HDR log encoded clip to SDR. Now, just below these settings, we see camera ISO and camera color temperature, but they aren't adjustable. That's because we need to switch our view to settings. So keep that in mind. Now I can select different ISOs from the pop-up menu. And I could set an exposure offset, much like an in-camera EV adjustment. Making these changes here is like changing them in camera during the shoot since they weren't baked in at that time. We are manipulating the raw sensor data. This is different from using the color grading tools, which are applied to the processed image and therefore won't have as much latitude. This is one of the key benefits of working with raw media, the ability to adjust exposure parameters non-destructively after the shoot. Now, if you didn't shoot at base ISO, Changing to a base ISO here won't improve the noise in your shot. But by the same token, if you did shoot at a base ISO for the cleanest image, you can now choose a nearby ISO without increasing the noise. That's why I recommended that you shoot at the base ISO even if you have to slightly over or underexpose to do so, since you can adjust that ISO in post. Now what about color temperature? It's clearly not adjustable here. That's because at the time of this recording, ProRes RAW shot on the Sony A7S III and recorded to the Ninja 5 does not allow for adjusting this white balance in post. Here's a list of devices that support adjustable ProRes RAW camera settings in Final Cut Pro. Now, note it was published in November of 2020, and it's terribly out of date. In fact, the Sony A7S III isn't even on it. However, I expect this to be updated soon, so stay tuned for that. Personally, I'm disappointed that adjustable color temperature is not supported for my A7S III at this time. But the good news is that since I shot in ProRes RAW, if that changes in a future update to Final Cut Pro, I'll have access to it. So shooting ProRes RAW is a great way of future-proofing your footage for greater manipulation in post as well as for HDR deliverables. So I mentioned that I'm in an SDR library. In fact, if I select the library, you can see that right here where it says standard in the inspector. If I click modify, you can see right here, I'm in a standard or SDR as opposed to HDR library. What this means when I add this HDR clip, because all raw clips by definition are gonna be HDR, I'll press E, I'm gonna get a warning saying that bright content will be clipped and that I need to either color correct or use the HDR tools effect to deal with that. This warning isn't really accurate with raw media because our camera LUT is already tone mapping the HDR image to SDR, so we can ignore it. And just a side comment on that, if you're working in an HDR library, the LUT that's applied will automatically know that it's in an HDR library and will be properly tone mapped to an HDR library. But since we're in SDR, the LUT that's applied tone maps to SDR, and we can really ignore this warning. But what's important to note is that another key benefit of working with ProRes RAW is that it's a great format for delivering an HDR. Although HDR workflow is beyond the scope of what we can cover today, so we'll continue working in this SDR library, assuming we need to deliver in Rec. 709 for broadcast or for web delivery. Okay, earlier I had you turn on 16.9 cropping on the Ninja, so I wanna show you what that does. Here I have a clip recorded with the cropping enabled. Notice the pixel dimensions in the inspector are 4240 by 2385. While that's larger than my 4K timeline, which is 3840 by 2160, they have the same aspect ratio. If you divide the numbers, you'll get 1.78 or 16 to nine. Now this next clip, I shot with the cropping turned off. Notice the size is 4264 by 2408, slightly larger in both dimensions. And the ratio is about 1.77. Final Cut by default is scaling both of these clips down to fit into the 3840 by 2160 timeline. But the second uncropped clip doesn't quite fit perfectly. It's so close you won't see letterboxing along the top and bottom. 
In fact, that's why I put this little white square here to see if you could see it, but it doesn't show because the difference is so small. But to be on the safe side, you really should go to the inspector, to the video inspector, to spatial conform, and change the type from fit to fill. And you'll see a very, very, very slight change because it's gonna scale it up a tiny bit. But if you use that crop function on the Ninja, you don't even have to worry about this. Okay, we've imported our ProRes RAW clips, set the RAW to log conversion and the camera light, and added some clips to our timeline. Now we can take advantage of the fact that these are 12-bit files with full color sampling. That additional color depth means we can manipulate luminance, hue, and saturation more than we could with, for example, the XAVC clips recorded in camera. So let's take a look at this example. My first clip is the ProRes RAW clip, and we can see in the inspector that I've set the RAW to log conversion to use the Sony S-Log3 S Gamut 3 Cine version because that's what I chose in camera. And then for the Camelot, I'm using this Phantom LUT that I also used loaded into the Ninja. So I'm getting a result that looks very much like what I saw on set. I recorded simultaneously to XAVC, which is this clip here. And we can see since I've applied that same camera LUT, our results look very close. If I go back and forth between them, if we just look in the viewer, they look pretty identical. The difference is you'll see there might be a slight bit of color shifting and there'll also be more noise in the ProRes RAW clip since we're bypassing the noise reduction in camera. We're also bypassing all the lens correction for things like chromatic aberration or lens barrel distortion. So we'll see some differences there as well. But in this particular clip, those aren't very obvious and it looks very similar. But what I wanna bring your attention to is the waveform. If we look at the XAVC clip, and check out the detail in the waveform and then switch to the ProRes RAW clip, notice how there's a lot more information. There's a lot more luminance information and color information, especially look down here when I toggle between the two. They're thicker traces. It means that there's more color information to work with. So for example, this clip seems to me a little bit underexposed by default. It's not crushed in the, in the shadows. It's certainly nowhere close to blown out in the highlights, but it's a little bit underexposed. Because I shot in RAW, I can adjust that ISO here in post. Of course, I could color correct for it as well, but by adjusting ISO, I'm doing something that is less destructive. And by destructive, you know, nothing's really destructive in manipulating colors, but as you continue to manipulate them more and more, you can start to break down the image. So setting the ISO, say, to 1,000 here, will give me some additional detail in the shadows. I'll still have nice um, low shadow uh, luminance values, but I can spread out some of this luminance information in the shadows and get more detail available. That would be a little more difficult to achieve in the version that was shot with everything baked in, in terms of ISO and white balance baked in. So um, with that adjustment made here to my ISO, I did make a color correction here and I'll open up the color board. All I did was raise the highlights. I just worked on luminance. I'm not really worried about color balance at this point in order to get my highlights a little closer to 90, 95 in that area. To do the same thing with my XAVC clip that's not ProRes RAW, because I can't adjust ISO, I needed to do more work. I needed to adjust the highlights, the mids, and even the shadows to attempt to get these two waveforms to match. If I toggle back and forth, you'll see they're very close and the images are very close, but I needed to do more work on this XAVC clip to get it in that same range. And you can see again, there's just not as much detail. Look how much more detail there is in the ProRes RAW clip. So hopefully this example illustrates how this 12-bit RAW files give you more information to work with and the fact that you can set ISO in advance before color correcting gives you more latitude. Now here's an example where I'm really pushing the color correction to demonstrate the difference between ProRes RAW and the other codecs that are done in camera. So I have this Sunrise clip and right now I'm on the ProRes version of it. And if I go to the info inspector, you can see I have the same raw to log conversion and the same camera LUT that we've been talking about. 
And if I go over to my XAVC clip, you'll see that has the same camera LED applied. So if I toggle between them, they look quite the same. Notice the lens barrel distortion correction is much more obvious here. The Ninja shot, the Pro's Raw shot, doesn't have that in-camera uh, lens barrel distortion fix. So if you look especially at the horizon line, you can see kind of warp between the two. So that's something that you need to take care of in post when you're shooting with ProRes RAW if there's noticeable lens bell distortion or chromatic aberration uh, as well. But these two match pretty well. Now, what I've done is added a significant color correction. I'll go and start first with my XAVC clip and enable this color correction and show it to you where I've really um, crushed the shadows here. And the reason I did that, if I, let's make this a little bit wider so we can see this a little better you'll see there's some significant banding that appears up here. Now you're looking at a YouTube compressed version of this, so I don't know how obvious this will be, but especially if I scrub the playhead, you can see some banding up here. In fact, let's go to 100% and look over here. It actually shows a little bit better if I'm looking at the full clip where you can really see that banding right there. Now, if I go to the ProRes RAW clip on the other hand and enable the same correction, in fact, let's just toggle between them so you can see that's the ProRes RAW and that is the XAVC clip. So from a color perspective, they're the same, but hopefully you can see the banding just completely disappears on the ProRes RAW clip versus the XAVC clip. And obviously this is really pushed, but it really shows you the difference of working with 12-bit versus 10-bit. And of course, if this was 8-bit, it would completely break up but ProRes RAW really allows you to push the grading without creating that kind of banding. Finally, we need to talk about noise. RAW files, as we've discussed, they bypass the in-camera processing like noise reduction, sharpening, and lens compensation, which includes adjusting for vignetting, chromatic aberration, and barrel distortion. So while you get more control over each of these things in post, it does mean you need to address them. Let's focus on noise reduction. So I have this interview shot here and I purposely exposed it for the bright background. And here's this ProRes RAW version and you can see in the inspector, we have the RAW to LAW conversion, the same as the other clips and the camera LUT also using that phantom LUT. If I pop over to the XAVC version, it has that same camera LUT applied so that we get the same result. If I toggle between them, you can see that they are uh, very, very similar. Now, I've color corrected both of these to uh, reveal our subject. And I'll show you my color correction here. And just a basic color board adjustment. I didn't do anything in saturation of color. I'm just working with luminance here uh, to show you what I needed to do in order to reveal our subject. And if I go to the ProRes RAW clip, I did a similar color adjustment. Now, let's zoom in close. Um, we're currently at 61% on this 4K clip. I'm gonna to go to 200% and let's take a look. So this is the XAVC clip. And again, this is a sort of extreme version because I really had to lift the shadows, but I wanted to demonstrate what's going on and make it clear. And you may or may not see this in the YouTube compression, but right now, uh, he has a lot of sort of breakup on this left side of his face in the shadow where we're seeing splotchiness and areas of color, solid color and areas of gray. Uh, this has been processed by the in-camera noise reduction. Let's look at the ProRes RAW clip and the same point. And at first you might be, oh my God, this is terrible because it's much noisier. Let's toggle between them. That's the in-camera XAVC. Remember HEVC codec in this case, be the same thing with H.264, where uh, we have basically what looks to me like some macro blocking in that shadow detail that you know we've pushed a lot, but um, it's much more even here in the ProRes RAW clip. Now you can use Final Cut's built-in noise reduction, but I don't find that that's very flexible. So what I've done here is to use neat videos noise reduction. And I've already run a profile and tweaked it. I'll turn it on so you can see the impact where uh, we get a really nice result um, compared to the other one. Let's toggle back and forth. So this is, uh, let's go back into our timeline and go down to XAVC. And you see this is really kind of broken up here. And then here 
with neat video, it needs to render again. Give it a second. It looks quite good. And remember, we're zoomed in at 200% here. So the moral of the story here is that ProRes RAW forces you to do noise reduction in post, but it gives you more flexibility and control, and you can probably get a better result than the in-camera noise reduction. You may not notice any difference at all on properly exposed clips, but clips that have a lot of shadow detail or where you need to do a lot of color correction, you can definitely notice a difference. The downside is, number one, you need to do the noise reduction in post, and uh, using neat video, you have to pay for a noise reduction plugin, and it takes a lot of processing power, a ton of render time, ton of render time to work with neat video. Great product, but that's what you pay for in the, is this render time uh, on that side of it. I'll go back to 100% here, and you can kind of see the difference here. There's a little bit of color shifting as well between the two that I'm seeing, but I, I find this ProRes result so much better in this kind of situation where let's say it just wasn't shot properly, even though I did this on purpose, it's a recoverable shot when shot in ProRes RAW, and it's really not a recoverable shot if it's encoded to something like HVC. Well, that took a bit longer than I thought, but I really wanted to show you the entire ProRes RAW workflow from setting up your camera and your Ninja through to using it in Fonica Pro and demonstrating some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks of doing so. I'm really interested in your thoughts about ProRes RAW, so please post a comment below. Thanks again to Atomos for supporting this video, and we'll see you next time here on MacBreak Studio.